Hey everybody, Casey Miratori here. This is part four of the RefTerm live stream. In this part, I talk about how the cache works on front of the glyph generation system, because of course the glyph generation system has to use direct write, which is very slow. If you haven't seen the other videos in this series and you find that there are some things I'm referring to that you don't know what I'm talking about, the links to those videos are in the description below so you can hop back and get more information on those parts of the system. Again, this whole thing is part of our Kickstarter promotion, so if you get a chance, also in the description below is a link to the Kickstarter for our awesome graphic novel series, Meow the Infinite. Please check it out when you get a chance. Without further ado, here is part four of the RefTerm live stream, and I will be back at the end to tell you about part five. Okay, so how does the cache work? The cache is based on a very simple concept, and I started the cache with one thing in mind, and then I realized that halfway through it, I could do way better using the exact same code if I just removed one of the aspects of it. And this is something that happens um, often, especially, again, like I said, if you're practicing that non-pessimization, if you actually go try to write the code that's the simplest code that'll do the thing that you want, a lot of times something even simpler will jump out at you. So. I don't sit down all the time. Ref term is like a very easy thing, right? So for someone who's had as much experience programming as I have, it's pretty easy to make a bunch of decisions that are generally non-pessimized. Is it the fastest terminal renderer? Absolutely not. If you actually did optimization, the number one version, you could blow ref term out of the water. I guarantee you that. I mean, even I could go do that, and I'm not that much of an optimization per person, right? But the non-pessimization, like 100x, 1000x, that you can do without doing optimization for reals. A lot of times, if you just do that, you will yourself find new, simpler ways of doing things because it's hard to conceptualize all this stuff in your head. There's a lot of details that your brain can't really uh, remember all of as it's thinking through what might happen based on decisions that you've made. Your brain can't do all of the things in a fairly complicated series of operations, like you know, a terminal renderer has enough operations in it that you won't think of them all. So when you actually go to type it in and you can see the code in front of your face, a lot of times you will think of simpler versions that are even less pessimized than the one that you already thought was fairly non-pessimized, which was the best you could think of at the time. It's yet another great benefit of practicing this kind of philosophy because you get better over time. If your philosophy is heap 3,000 string classes and STL and 8 million allocations and all this other stuff on top of it, you'll never get any better, you'll only get worse because the way that you program is about adding meaningless work to things. If instead your philosophy is remove meaningless work for things, you get better over time at doing that because you learn new techniques that would never have been obvious when you first sit down and look at the problem. Now, I'm saying this as someone who's programmed for like 35 years professionally, no, 25 professionally, 35 total or something like that. A very, very long time I've been programming. I sat down to write ref term. I learned something in the first eight hours. Well, the ninth hour of programming, I learned something, right? I learned something. So it's a never ending learning process. If you're actively trying to simplify code and keep it non-pessimized, you learn things every day. Every day you see a new technique that you could use to stop giving the CPU so much unnecessary work to do. So I'll talk about what that was. My first conceptualization for the way this cache would work was fairly straightforward. And the way it worked was I said, okay, it's gonna be two levels, right? I'm gonna have a cache. Um, it's gonna have entries in a table. So this is my table. It's gonna be a power of two long. The reason it's gonna be a power of two long is because I wanna be able to just mask off and index into it. So I, I want it to be a power of two, so just like the bits can just directly address into it when I produce values that are gonna index, index into it. Um, so it's going to be like a hash table where I compute some value and then I'm gonna take just some bits from the value to look up into it. Uh, and then I'm going to have, right, a, um, a texture, right? We know this is gonna happen on the GPU where all the glyphs are, right? 
So this is like, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, you know, right? And each entry into the table, its job is going to be to be mapping some like input character, right? So it's going to be mapping some input character to some glyph in the table, right? Now that's what I knew the structure of this thing would look like. It's very straightforward. I have inputs, right? I know they have to go to direct write to generate stuff. I know they're going to go into a texture I'm going to use. So I know that my inputs are the things that come from the parser. I know my outputs are which of these glyphs correspond with it, right? But my first conceptualization of how this mapping would occur is that a chunk of data would come in. So maybe that chunk of data is just, is just the letter A. Or maybe it's like a bunch of things, like multiple characters that uh, produce like the you know the the Japanese uh, or or Chinese glyph uh, for for what is that wood uh, tree, right? So maybe this chunk is like multiple. So this is like you know two. It's two characters. I don't know how to represent them here because they're not printable characters. They're two binary characters that resolve to that glyph. Or we have. Uh, for example, a simple ASCII character here, like just the lowercase a, that was baked into it a long time ago, so it's only going to be one byte. So this is one byte, this is two bytes, let's say. So in these cases, I knew that I was going to be able to feed something into the front here that was one or two bytes or four bytes or whatever, and get one glyph out the back. So maybe the, the you know, the glyph for this would, would just be in there, right? In a bunch of cases, I'd be able to do that. But in other cases, uh, and I'm, I apologize, I can't, for example, write some of these more complicated cases, like something like Farsi, um, where, you know, if you've ever seen the way it's written, they'll typically be like a, a starting character, but then the characters will like attach to each other as they go, right? So there might be something where the font designer designed some glyph that if you looked at how the Farsi glyph lays out, it's going to be in multiple cells. So these two might, this one might also be double width. So this might be two, this might be one, but these maybe these both fit into, this would be a half width one, let's say, right? But we know for a fact that some script languages like Farsi, the glyph designer will have wanted to do, it will be prettier and easier to read if they're able to make a single glyph that represents multiple characters in the Farsi. Um, and you could think of this as if you imagined, let's say in the US, where we're writing um, like with the Roman alphabet, the example would be, let's suppose the standard way we did typography and like books and stuff was more like cursive. So all of the letters were connected, right? You could easily imagine a font designer wanting to take some very common words, like let's say the, and make an entire glyph for the, where it all like flows really nicely, instead of the crappy thing they do now where it always has to line up on each character so that they kind of abut. So Farsi works more like the second case. They want to be able to put in glyphs that will look nice in their language the way that someone would actually write them, exactly the way we would do with cursive, but nobody does because nobody cares now because nobody writes cursive, right? But you could imagine if we'd cared about cursive, that would be what we would do. And there probably are some fonts out there that do do that. Um, it's just very rare because people don't typeset in cursive hardly ever. So this was an important case to me. I don't like the idea of shipping programs that roll over and die whenever someone from a different country uses them uh, when, you know, I can usually think of algorithms that will work uh, for these extended cases. So I wanted to handle that here, and I doubly wanted to handle it because it doesn't work correctly in most terminal programs. So again, it was another attempt for me to say, look, you don't have to be slow even if you handle these corner cases. If you just think about it and don't add a lot of extra work, you can be fast. So what I wanted to do is take something like this and have it go in there, and it seemed to me, at the time, it seemed to me, because I wasn't thinking hard enough about it, that that meant that there had to be multiple glyph pointers in here. Right? So they're, they're not pointers because they're indexes into a table, but you know, multiple ones. So if this um, piece of Farsi 
you know, was some number input, I don't know, let's say it takes five bytes in uh, and produces three glyphs, something like that. Well, then I thought I would need at least three, you know, I'd, I'd feed five bytes into it and I'd get three uh, bytes out that are which glyphs would go there. Now, this creates a really big problem. This, this is tough because what that means is that when I then go in here and I have to use uh, this table to do stuff, I end up in a situation where I, I, I can't just have a fixed size or I can have a fixed size, but it means I have to impose a limit. So maybe like I look at what most fonts longest Farsi output glyph set would be and I set it to that, but then the table gets kind of bloated. You see why I'm kind of like, nah? Because if I want these to be fixed entries into a table that I look up quickly, I didn't want to have a like brackets 12 in here or something for the indices into this thing and say, well, you can only have 12 as the maximum percent, right? Isn't that? But that's what I did at first because I couldn't think of another way. It's like, ah. So the first implement table, implementation of the table was exactly that. It had little slots in here. And it was more complicated because I had to allocate these things to the slots. So the first version of the table that I did, when I did a lookup, what I would do is I would take the hash of the input bytes. So the five bytes come in, I hash the value, I use that hash to look up into the table, I see whether or not I hit on that index, right? Um, and when I find the hit, I had a chaining thing that, that I do to try and... Um, uh, we can look at that when we actually look at the code. In order to handle uh, resolves, there's a chaining thing that I do to like chain entries together. Um, but that's neither here nor there. When I hit on the cache, what I did is I just had a little array, and that array was the maximum number of output cells you could have, was the number of output glyphs you could have for the input. So you could feed any size into it. You could feed 100 bytes worth into it, because it would just hash them and look it up. But then the output was like limited to 12 characters. Now in practice, would this have been a problem? Probably not, but is it great? No, because A, it has a limit, and B, it, it makes this table more unwieldy. The actual entries into this table um, become bloated at that point, right? They're bigger than they need to be, because most of the time, that's not happening. Um, even in Farsi, most of the time that wouldn't be happening. Most Farsi outputs, wouldn't be as long as the longest Farsi output. So even in the language that I was targeting for the worst case of this particular situation, it was actually not a very good algorithm for it because it was paying that cost of the longest output for most of the things that were, would never have been that long. So it's bad even for the case that I was trying to pick as the outermost case. It's not even performing very well there compared to what I'd hoped. But that's when I realized this was dumb. And the reason I was able to realize this was dumb is because I've worked with hashes before. If I'd never worked with hashes before, I've worked with hashes a ton now. Like I've implemented all kinds of hashes. I designed a hash function that wasn't particularly good called meow hash, the original. And then I worked with uh, Jacob uh, on designing the future versions of meow hash, which are actually quite good. Um, but all of that work paid off because having thought about hashes a bunch, I was like, wait, this is dumb. You have a hash on the input, and you know you made the hash quite strong, right? And by the way, uh, uh, there's there's uh, Peter Nielsen Schmidt, I believe is his name, was on the stream and helped me with this because I made a hash that wasn't that strong really quickly on the stream, and he was like, you should do this instead, it'll be much stronger, because he's a crypto guy, uh, so he, he, he does cryptography work, and so, uh, that was a great part of doing that one thing on the live stream because it meant I got a free crypto upgrade because I'm I mean I work with hashes but I'm not a cryptographer and and Jacob did the cryptography stuff so so I I'm not qualified to do crypto stuff so we got a free upgrade on the crypto part of things uh, thanks to people watching the stream which is a great thing about streaming is you get a brain upgrade sometimes when you stream it's harder for you to code when you're streaming but you, you know if experts watch your stream from time to time you get their knowledge right? And it's hard to uh, understate just how powerful that can be when you get some experts who are in your blind spots, like things you don't know very much about. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome, right? That's neither here nor there, but you know, thank you to Peter for that. So I was like, wait, I've got a hash on the front end. 
why don't I just include in the hash which of the gl output glyphs you're doing, and then I don't have to do any of this. So instead of hashing, you know, when I had the letter A, right? Instead of just hashing A, why don't I hash A plus the number, right? And I don't mean plus in that sense. Let me draw it with one of those like operator symbols. Let me concatenate a zero onto the end of this. So it's A and then the zero that I hash. So that way when I have things that are multiple glyphs long, so for example, I take something in Farsi that's going to come out to be multiple glyphs, right? So I take five bytes in, whatever those five bytes are, I take five bytes in and I then ask for the glyphs in order by concatenating on to the hash, zero, one, two, etc. right? So now you look up once into the table for every output glyph, which means there can be an infinite number of output glyphs and it still works. So this turned out to be a much better hash design and now this goes away. There's now just one reference to the glyph uh, texture in order to do an infinite number of output bytes for every input sequence. The rest is just, you know, a CS homework assignment. If you want to do a texture cache, well, there's not much more to it. You know what you're feeding in. You know that direct write is the thing that you have to call to ask the system what the font should look like. So if you find that you miss this cache, you ask dwrite to produce the glyph and you stick the glyph where it should go and you're done. Right? So that's it. So now we have isolated the MS bad part of the code, right? Behind this cache, we know that as long as you're able to make this cache large enough to fit the general working set of glyphs that the typical program that the user is running happens to need, that you can abstract away all this bad stuff, right? Is it as good as we would like? No, the good version would get rid of all this stuff and put in a glyph generator that was actually good, i.e. not the one from DWrite, and a Unicode parser that was actually good, i.e. not the one from Uniscribe, but dealing with bad code that is slow and unwieldy is part of the job, and caches are exactly what solve that problem, right? Caches allow you to take stuff that doesn't work or is slow or whatever and put them behind something that makes them appear to have a reasonable API that completes in a reasonable amount of time. So, with this in place, you can do anything you want. Not only can you do all of your DWrite stuff, right? But you can put anything else you want in there. This system will run equally fast putting arbitrarily many glyph generators on the back end. It could have custom glyph generators for things. It could have special emoji thing. It could be ones that generate squares that are bigger if it wanted to. It could do whatever you want, right? Go nuts. So this system is great because once you've isolated one piece of bad code, it's actually free to pile as much bad code as you want back there because it only gets asked to do something very rarely, right? Very rarely. And in fact, earlier versions of the program, which I then eventually removed for simplicity, had GDI back here as well. You, you could have just called GDI to fill the texture cache, and the whole rest of the system didn't know, because it all just goes through the texture cache. Now, one thing I should mention that was mentioned one time, and is 100% incorrect, so it's worth pointing out, is somebody said, well, you know, uh, we're, we're already going as fast as we can with like reference to Windows Terminal or whatever, or we're already going very fast. Caching wouldn't help this because direct write already caches things. Who cares, right? Uh, again, these are non-statements. I don't care what direct write caches. It only matters how fast direct write is. So if direct write is slow, I don't care what it caches. It could cache anything it wants to. If it's slow, it's slow. You put caches over the things that are slow. If they're slow and they're caching, well, they just wrote a bad cache. It's not my problem, and I don't care. So it doesn't matter what these things do when you talk about performance. So that's an example of a fake optimization comment. They heard caches were fast, and they heard direct write caches, so they assumed it was going fast. But it doesn't matter what something's doing. What something's doing doesn't matter to whether it goes fast or not. It only matters whether the performance of the thing 
lines up with the performance that it should be getting on the hardware that it's implemented on. So when you can obviously see that that thing isn't running fast enough, fake optimization comments don't help you. It doesn't help to say that it has a custom version of men copy that's faster. It doesn't help, have, help to say that it's caching internally. Who cares? Right? Who cares? Code running fast has nothing to do with a bullet point list of things that you read in a slide that you then say that you did. It does not matter at all. The only things that matter is when you run the code, how fast is it compared to the number of op operations that that CPU can do of the type that you were doing. That's the only thing that matters, right? And if you are slow compared to that, you can have the complete laundry list of everything someone at Google has ever put up a slide saying that something is fast about, and it doesn't matter because it was still slow. So something else was wrong, and you don't need to know. Slap a cache on top of it and never talk to it again. That's my opinion. Eventually, like I said, if you're doing a real terminal rasterizer, you would get rid of all these things and you just have your own glyph generator. It would probably run directly on the GPU and it would be much faster than this system. But given the constraints that I had to work with, this is a pretty good compromise. Now, we can make it a better compromise still, and we did. Um, or I guess I did. I guess uh, it was mostly just me on ref term. But um, the, the cache here, right, requires an expensive hash function to look up into. We know that most of the time, we're not going through one of these complicated cases. Like most of the time, we're not being asked to generate multi-byte Farsi glyphs, for example. The user of the terminal may know ahead of time. Let's say they are French. So most of the things that they're going to output are in French. They're not going to call Farsi, right? They're not going to call, you know, things for Sweden. <laughs> they're not going to call Japanese characters, right? They're not going to print those out. What I added at the initialization time of the cache is the ability to lock a series of entries in the texture cache to a pre-computed set of glyphs that are direct mapped in the cache. What that means is that there will be a function that you write where you take certain letters that you think should always be locked and map them directly into slots by index, bypassing this hash function and saving you time. So in my version, because I you know, speak English, I locked the English ASCII codes into it and some punctuation, and those are direct mapped in the cache. So whenever those are flow flowing by, it never has to call the hash function. Only when I'm actually looking at things that have these uh, more advanced characters, right, do I have to do that. So that's another thing the cache does to make sure that it isn't running unnecessarily slow is it just has the ability to direct map because it's free to do so. So everywhere that I look up, it just goes, oh, is this a complex character or not? If it's not, it doesn't go through the path where it actually runs the hash table. That's it for part four. I'll be back here tomorrow with part five where I'll go over the very small bit of actual optimization that I did on RefTerm, why I did that, and how that optimization worked. Until then, if you get a chance, please take a look at the description below for the link to our Kickstarter. We'd love to send you a cool graphic novel or two if you get a chance. I'll be back here tomorrow with the next part. Until then, I'll see everyone on the internet.